exam, remember that there are 14 problems, 15 multiple choice questions, and uh, each problem carries five points, while each of the multiple choice carries two points. And uh, be sure that you study these topics, especially the number, uh, ones that are numbered, because that's where the problems come from. And when it comes to concepts, well, you need to study most of what I tell you today, but that won't cover everything. Remember, you got to go get everything that we had done for all the 19 days. Thank you. Yeah, welcome to the finals review. Smile. It's good to smile always, you know. And uh, I've identified some topics. We start with waves, right? And as soon as you think about waves, you have to know you should know the equation for a progressive wave. An equation for a progressive wave. There are many ways of writing it, but one way of putting the equation for a progressive wave is y is equal to a sine 2 pi by lambda kx minus omega t or x minus bt. I'm going to give both. Now, in this equation, you have to know that y is the displacement, of course, along the y-axis, a is the amplitude, lambda is the wavelength, v is the velocity of the wave, and can you tell me, is this wave propagating along the positive x-axis or the negative x-axis? Positive, because if it is going in the opposite direction, this minus would turn into a plus. That is one of the equations for a progressive wave. The second way of writing the equation for a progressive wave is a sine kx minus omega t. In this equation, again, a is the amplitude k. Does anybody remember what k is? What is it called? It's called the wave number. And definitely it is. You can see if you distribute this, k comes in place of that when it gets multiplied with this. So k is 2 pi by lambda. That's what I'm trying to say. k is 2 pi by lambda. And again, if you distribute this, you know, omega, what is omega? It's going to be 2 pi by lambda times Vt. There's a lot there. But what's important here is, can anybody tell me how to find the speed of this wave? Got to be careful. If you have a doubt on that, Carbon, you have to look at the units, right? Uh, I think you gave it the other way. It's omega over k. Speed of a progressive wave is omega over k. All right, that is topic number one. Number two, Doppler effect. And if you have a number coming up on the right side, that means it's picked for a problem, all right? On this one, yes, this, there is a problem using Doppler effect. This is the standard equation. And in this equation, you know, F is the actual frequency. What's this? What's V? Speed of sound. Speed of the listener speed of the source and the most the most important thing here is to know that the direction of sound waves towards the listener is taken as the positive direction the direction of sound waves towards the listener is taken as positive that is what is important here and to demonstrate that i have set up an example so you have a source which is moving to the right side as you can see producing waves, sound waves go in all directions, doesn't it? But we are only concerned with the sound waves going towards the listener, and because the listener is towards the right side, that's why I have drawn sound waves going towards the listener. So that direction is positive, correct? That direction is positive. Therefore, the source and the listener both are moving in the positive direction, which means these two signs do not change. Everything is okay, will not change. But let's say that the source has now gone past the listener because the listener was moving slower, so the source is moving fast. You know what I'm trying to say, right? So the source has gone past, and that's, that's where the source is now. And therefore, now you'll have to, again, consider the direction of sound waves towards the listener as positive. So that direction is positive. That's positive then both the listener and the source are moving in the opposite direction, isn't it? Therefore, both of their signs will change. And in this particular case, the equation that you use 
would be with both signs changed from a negative to a positive. That's problem number one. Not particularly in that order, you know, but that's a problem. If you see that number coming up on the right side, that means it's for a problem. If you don't see that number, it's conceptual. That's what I mean. All right, there is a problem from standing waves, and how do you get standing waves? When you have two progressive waves moving in opposite directions, interfering with each other. That's where you get a standing wave. A standing wave is also called a stationary wave. What's so important about a standing wave is there are some points that are not vibrating. They are called the nodes. Some other points that have maximum vibration, they are called antinodes. And the distance between a node and an antinode, I mean a consecutive one, is how much? In terms of wavelength? Lambda by 4. Distance from a node to an antinode is lambda by 4. But from a node to another node is lambda by 2. Or from an antinode to another antinode is lambda by 2. See, I'm, I'm only talking about the important things that you have to know. And this equation that's coming up is for the fundamental vibration of a stretched string. What are the factors on which it depends? There are three factors. It depends on the tension. It depends on the mass per unit length, which is mass of one meter. And it also depends on the total length of the string, right? And that is the expression. F is 1 by 2 L square root Ft by mu. OK. Uh, L is the length of the string that is vibrating. Be careful about that. That's the vibrating length. That is the tension, of course, in newtons. And mu is always in kilogram per meter, because that's the mass of one meter. And what do you mean by fundamental mode? The whole string vibrates in one segment. That's what you mean by fundamental mode. And you know that multiples of the fundamental frequency are called harmonics. And what is the general equation for a harmonic? I thought I wrote it. Yeah, in this case, L is equal to lambda by 2. You know that, isn't it? OK, you know total length. All right. Number of strings, or number of segments, I should have said, number of segments is equal to the number of the harmonic. In this case, how many segments do you have? In this case, it's vibrating as one segment, so this is the first harmonic. That means the first harmonic is just the fundamental frequency. If it vibrates in two segments, then the frequency is going to be twice that. Three is going to be three times that, OK? Uh, that's simple. The third topic is capacitance. Capacitors, the fundamental equation for a capacitor is charge divided by voltage gives you capacitance. The unit of capacitance is farad, which is coulomb over volt. We know that. That's an important one. When you connect capacitors in series, what ch stays the same? You already saw it. Charge is the same. But if you connect them in parallel, then the voltage is going to be the same. And the two equations, I thought I wrote the two equations. If I did not, when you connect them in parallel, you add them up, isn't it? You add them up. And if it is in series, you take 1 over C is 1 over C1 plus 1. Oh, I did. OK. 1 over C is 1 over C1 plus 1 over C2, and parallel would be just the sum of the two. And I also want to say that for a parallel plate capacitor, the capacitance is given by what? C is equal to the wrong way. K A epsilon naught by D. That is the equation for capacitance of a parallel plate capacitor. K is the dielectric constant. A is the overlapping area of the plates. That means you only take the area of one plate, isn't it? Both have the same area. D is the distance between the plates. Okay. Epsilon naught, you know, is 8.85 times 10 to the negative 12. Don't these appear to be a little bit more easier as we go through it? Which means you have done a lot of study. If it's still tough, you never read it. Relax. Number four takes us to current. The, I mean, Ohm's law is current is voltage divided by resistance. 
And resistance of a conductor depends on four factors, isn't it? Depends on the material. That is called the specific resistance or the resistivity, right? Increases with the length. Decreases with the area of cross-section, which is usually pi r squared, because most of the conductors have a circular cross-section. Nothing there. That's easy to understand. But when you come to connecting resistors, you know that the formulas are exactly the opposite of what you do in capacitors. Please don't mess up on those. In, in series, resistance just adds up, and in parallel, it's 1 over r is 1 over r1 plus 1 over r2. But again, know that whenever you have them connected in series, what quantity is going to be the same? The current is going to be the same. And in parallel, like before, the voltage is going to be the same. Okay. Number five. Oh, the famous Kirchhoff's law. All right. I, I thought I should, you know, you have KCL and, uh, well, not potassium chloride, but KCL. <laughs> Kirchhoff's current law and Kirchhoff's voltage law, isn't it? So both of those I'm trying to demonstrate with a crazy circuit. A simple one. Uh, one last time, you just call it all this and okay, label the resistances. And I just, instead of putting E1, E2, I just said, okay, assume that that's 5 volt, this is 3, this is 2. I don't know what circuit I tried to write it in, but I'm sure you know the rules. These are the rules. Obviously, I started from A. So if you start from A, when you're going through this resistance, aren't you going in the direction of the flow of current? Yes. So it's a potential drop. A drop means a negative, correct? Therefore, it's going to be minus, if I call this current I1, then the potential drop is negative I1 R1. Why? Again, because you're going in the direction of the current. And then when you get here, Aren't you going from the positive to the negative through the cell? Therefore, you're going to say minus 3. And then you go up here again. Still, you're flowing with the current. So it's minus, if the current is I2, minus I2, R2. But when you go here, this time you're going from negative to positive. So it's plus 5 is equal to 0. Okay, I, A, B, E, F, O. That's the one, A, B, E, F, A. So minus I1, R1 minus 3, minus I2, R2, <coughs> plus 5, is equal to 0. Kirchhoff's laws are easy. All of physics is easy if understood. But at every point, as you can see, you have to understand something, isn't it? Like you have to know which is negative, what's positive. That is the deal. Yes, Abdul? Shouldn't I1 and I2 be the same? Because Shouldn't that? No, because it's the same loop. Really? Really? Wait, hold on. Hold on. Don't you think that the current here, I1, will split into two here? Yeah, but it connects back. Oh, so it connects back up here, so it should... Oh, he's thinking. That's right. Correct? Yes. Yeah. The current here and here will not be the same, but these two are the same. Well, of course, the current that starts from the, the battery has mm -hmm. to return to the battery. So, Actually, there was no need of me labeling this as I2. That's what he means. This was still, two yes, this was still I1. Yeah. Did everybody hear me? This is still I1. Okay, thank you. Good. All right, number six. A charged particle moving in a magnetic field. We've come to that chapter now. Magnetic field. Does anybody know the formula for a charged particle entering a magnetic field? A force acts on it, and that force is given by Q V cross B. Q V cross B. And of course, it's a cross product of two vectors. And you know, a cross product turns out to be VB sine theta. That means theta is the angle between the velocity of the particle and the magnetic field. Theta is the angle between the velocity of the particle and the magnetic field. So if a charged particle is moving 
parallel to a magnetic field. What's the force acting on it? I thought tomorrow you have your finals. Okay. So no, no force. And when do you have maximum force acting? When it's perpendicular. In that case, it will be QVB because sine 90 is 1. And if you have the magnetic field set up in a big enough area, you know that the charged particle will be compelled to make a circle. In which case, the centripetal force must be equal to QVB. And when you do all that, when you set them equal, you're going to get the radius as MV by QB. It's always good to know the reason behind how you get a formula. That's when you'll be able to do problems. You know what I mean? How did I get that? How did I get R is equal to MV by QB? Oh, by setting the centripetal force equal to QVB. It's always good to know how a formula comes up. Because that's what I might be twisting in there. Because I already know you have this formula with you. Okay. So you're setting a centripetal force? Equal to QVB, you rearrange that, you get this. Number seven. This favorite chapter of ours, electromagnetic induction. Electromagnetic induction. Faraday's law. An EMF is induced whenever the magnetic field associated with the circuit changes. What's the direction of the induced EMF? Always, always opposite to the cost that produces it. Don't you think? I can ask you some conceptual questions there. Well, you have to remember that a clockwise current is a south pole, isn't it? A clockwise current is a south pole, because I have taught you how to write an S, right? Okay, and, and a counterclockwise current is a north pole. So keep that in mind to figure out maybe a conceptual question. Okay, so this is the formula that you get from Faraday's law. E is minus N d phi by dt. And if it's a coil rotating in a magnetic field, what kind of uh, current do you get if a coil rotates in a magnetic field? Is it AC or DC? What a silly question. AC, because you get DC from a battery. Come on. And AC. Therefore, if the coil is rotating, then E is equal to E naught sine omega t, or it may be E is equal to E naught cos omega t, where E naught is the peak value, isn't it? Does anybody remember the value for peak value? The form NBA omega. I'm sure there are some students here, not all of you, who could take the exam without a formula sheet. They have trained themselves so hard. I mean, they've spent so many hours. I know. I know. For a person to get a 98 on this exam, that person should have spent a lot of quality time. I hope you know what I mean by quality time. Yeah. That person did do and Good. Thank you. That keeps me going. Okay. E naught is NBA omega. NBA. You will never forget NBA. NBA omega. Take care of the units all the time. N is the number of turns. It has no unit. B is in Tesla. A is in meter squared. And what about omega? If I give you it's rotating 30 times in a second, is that omega? Yeah, it has to be in radians per second, so it's 2 pi times the linear frequency. So omega is 2 pi f. That's what I mean. All right. So that is the formula for... Peak EMF. That was number seven, eight. LCR circuit. You knew that was coming. When you connect an inductance, capacitance, and a resistance in series with each other and apply an alternating EMF. And you also did, many of this you did labs, so that should have made it clearer. The impedance is given by square root R squared plus omega L minus 1 by omega C whole squared. What, what is funny is, if it's an LC circuit, if it's an LC circuit and no resistance, which is practically not possible, correct? Because mm -hmm. a coil will always have resistance. So, but in, just imagine, I ask you something like that. I just tell you, an inductance and capacitance are connected together. What's the formula for impedance? Well, what you got to do is, because the resistance is non-existent, just set that equal to zero. Why can't people do that? 
And so if I tell you it's just a resistance and an inductance, then the capacitance doesn't exist, so this term becomes? Yeah. So in one formula, you have so many. And if you have all of them, then you know that the phase difference, finally, tan phi, is given by omega L minus 1 by omega C by R. And the same thing applies here, same thing. If the capacitance doesn't exist, set this equal to zero. If the inductance doesn't exist, you know what I'm trying to say, right? Correct? Mm -hmm. Yes? Those are the XLs and the XLs. Oh, yeah, the XL is omega. Yeah, I knew you would ask, so I wrote it down. <laughs> XL is omega L, and XC is 1 by omega C. What do you know about an inductance? As the frequency increases, its reactance also increases. So an inductance, this is conceptual, an inductance opposes high frequencies a lot more. What, how much reactance does it offer DC? What's the frequency of DC? Frequency of DC. So what's the inductive reactance for DC? Yeah, you have to know that. But when you talk about a capacitance, it's exactly the opposite. If the frequency is zero and it goes into the denominator, you know one divided by zero is infinite, right? Undefined or too big to be defined. So a capacitance is a DC blocker. I've used the exact words. It blocks DC. So that is something conceptual that you have to remember there. Number nine, lenses. Uh-uh. All right. Some people do not know the difference between a lens and a mirror. Yet... <coughs> Okay, news. Lenses are transparent. <laughs> the light rays will go through them. A mirror reflects. Can you remember that? <laughs> because we, we had like three or four diagrams. Some people will call it a concave mirror and draw a concave lens. And the rules here, conceptually, are very important. You have to know that everything is opposite for them, isn't it? Okay, so let me run over this one time. What do you want me to start with, a lens or a mirror? Lens. lens because convex lens, what kind of images can it produce? Convex lens can produce both real and virtual. A convex lens. Because its focus is real, that's why. Its focus is real. Therefore, it can produce both real and virtual. Okay, when does it produce a virtual image? I mean, I'm looking for the position of the object. When does, we did this. Remember those big cardboards and the dance in the lab? Never forget. When does a convex lens produce a virtual image? When the object is inside its focus. How can you forget that? And what kind of virtual image is that? Upright, that's the only, it's only virtual images that are upright. All real images are inverted. Therefore, what about the magnification of a real image? It's always negative. A magnification of a real image is negative. Magnification of a virtual image is positive. Why should there be any confusion? I don't know. It only shows HI is inverted. That's why it's negative, right? Okay. And what about a concave lens? What about its focus? Real or virtual? Virtual. Therefore, it can only produce virtual image. Concave lens is just like a convex mirror. You heard me? And a convex lens is just like a concave mirror. So actually, what did I teach you this 19 days? Nothing much. Look at that. It's all condensed into one day. And the most important formula is 1 by F is equal to 1 by DO plus 1 by DI. Please, please remember DO, DI, and F, all three are measured from the lens or the mirror. They're always measured from whatever is reflecting or whatever is refracting. So if I tried to challenge you by giving some distance, Please read the question. Make sure that's DO. 
I don't remember having done it this time, or maybe I did. One time I said this. Cool enough, I said, the distance between the object and the image is 45 centimeters. Cool, right? The distance between the what? The object and the image. You want to know how many people took that as D.O.? And I had written clearly the distance between the object and the image. So what was that? No. Was that D.O.? No. no. Was that D.O. plus D.I.? Depends. If it was a real image and I was talking about a convex lens. Isn't it? I don't know where I can write now. So if uh, the object is here, the image would be here. This is what you call D.O., correct? Isn't this what is D.I.? Come on. So if I gave you this distance, isn't it D.O. plus D.I.? Mm -hmm. yeah. If it is a real image. But if it's a virtual image, it's D.O. minus D.I. Think about it. So I could do that, and I'm not saying I did that, but you have to read every question. Read. Read. Don't just go, yeah, 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 this looks like D.O. <laughs> <laughs> this looks Magnification is negative H. No, magnification is HI by HO or negative DI by DO. And I tried to summarize everything that I told you now. Converging lens. Oh, converging means convex. Convex lens, concave mirror. I, I think I wrote that later on. Diverging lens, convex mirror, or concave lens. Yes, I did look. The summary of the whole chapter in that table. Everything. Any questions? Yeah, I'll have a question at the end. Why didn't you get a 90 on the exam? If you don't have any questions now, that means everything is clear. So my question will be, why didn't you get a 90 on the exam? I'll just ask myself. I can't ask you. After you, today, you're gone. No questions, right? Everybody understood this? Okay, good. Number 10. Thin films. Ah, the dance begins with thin films because there's a lot of understanding again there. Thin films. You can also treat it as learning it the first time. You would still understand if you're listening really, really carefully. Surely that's the incident ray. And what happens to the incident ray? A part of it is reflected, and another part of it is refracted. Okay, so reflected, refracted. And the refracted part is again reflected. And then it comes out. So let's assume that this is just air and water. Before I ask you anything else, let me just ask you one and two. Let me let that two come up. Which one is traveling through a greater path? Two. And if you're looking at it from right above, which is what you have to learn, what's the path difference? Isn't it twice the thickness of the film? Why twice? Because it's going down, coming back up. Isn't it? That's why it's twice. But there is something additional. What is that? That's what you have to remember. Whenever reflection takes place, while the ray is trying to go from less dense to more dense, there is an additional path jump off. OK, where does that take place? Does it take place here? Let me call it A or B. Where does that additional path? Where do you think it's trying to go from less dense to more dense? A, because that's air. That's water. Here is trying to go from water into air, back again, or maybe something else, which I have not specified, so you need not care about that. You know what I mean? OK, if this was going from water into something more dense, are you listening? Mm -hmm. Then that additional path jump also takes place at B. Then you need not consider it at all. Why? Because both of them jumped, so the path difference is still what? 2T. Right? But as in this case, if it only took place here, if the jump only took place here, let me stop this. Did the path difference between 2 and 1 increase or decrease? Because 1 was already lagging behind, 1 was lagging, and now it got a jump. It got a jump. What happened to the path difference? Decrease. So why can't you write 2 and T 
minus lambda by 2. Isn't that right? And if you're looking for the condition for brightness, you would set it equal to m lambda. Mm -hmm. I told you the whole story. 2nt minus, what's I saying 2t? It's actually 2nt. Why? Because if it travels 5 centimeters in air, it travels 5 times the refractive index in that material. So the path difference is 2nt minus lambda by 2 is equal to m lambda. Last one. What if the additional jump took place only here? So the second one was already leading, wasn't it? By 2nt and it jumped down. So what happened? 2nt plus lambda by 2, and if I'm looking for the condition for brightness, you would set it equal to m lambda. Is this interference or diffraction? What are we talking about? And what's the condition for brightness in interference? Path difference is equal to m lambda. What's the condition for darkness? Path difference is equal to? I don't know. Did you get it as m minus half or m plus half? m plus half lambda. Both will work. Only the starting numbers of m will be different. Well, that's very... It's all clear. After all, it's physics, so it should be clear. It should be easy. Yes, Elizabeth, you're on YouTube. Go ahead. Um, the, the, like, the test question was like non-reflecting. Non-reflecting. So it was talking about lenses, and it, we did talk about that in class because I remember I boasted about my lens <laughs> having a non-reflective coding. Do you remember that? And so if it says non-reflective, what are you trying to do? Are you trying to cancel out the rays, or are you trying to, cancel. you know, are you trying to increase its vigor, for the lack of other words? Cancel. You're trying to cancel out. It's non-reflective. You do not want those two rays to come back into your eye. So are you looking for the condition for brightness or darkness? Darkness. That, those are the, that's why I'm saying read problems carefully, non-reflective, think. This is logic plus math. This is not math plus math. Math is great. Math is very useful. But without logic, it's useless. Thank you. 11. Diffraction. And particularly, diffraction grating. Do you know what a diffraction grating is? Remember I told you so many lines drawn close to each other on a transparent piece of glass. What happens? It's like so many slits together. Now tell me, is this actually diffraction or is this actually interference? It is interference. So we go back to the condition for maximum as m lambda. What is the only case where you would talk about conditions being switched? Diffraction in a single slit, isn't it? There. I should stop and breathe so people listen. Diffraction at a single slit, the condition for darkness is m lambda. That's the only case where it's the opposite. So when you come back to a grating, it's just the same as before. And the grating law, actually this is called the grating law, sine theta is n m lambda. Is this a good, again, I'm checking. Is this condition for darkness or brightness? Brightness, brightness, because this is interference again. It's brightness. Before you say the wrong thing, okay. And uh, if you are interested, you know how this N came about? Actually, usually we have a D here, isn't it? D sine theta. It's the same thing. If you had a D here, it's going to be 1 by D here, for those who are listening. And 1 by D will just be the number. Uh, for example, if I give you the width of a slit, now, this might be interesting. If I give you the width of a slit as 0 0.01 meter, just an example, 0 0.01 meter, how many slits do you have in one meter? Oh, obviously I'm so fast always. If I give you the width of a slit in a grating, correct? There are so many. And I give you, instead of giving you the number of lines, because everybody's looking for number of lines, I don't give it. I give you the width of a slit. Now what's going to happen to a slit? Width of a slit? Width? Width? Ah, oh, he's a trickster. <laughs> That's not what you do. 
Because you would have, maybe you're looking for theta, right? So you know you have to find that. I'm teaching you how to think. M, hmm, it's specified, the first order, whatever, lambda is given. So you know, N is not given. And instead, he's given us the width of the slit, right? So you should know, by common sense, that somehow you could get the number in one meter. Now answer my question. If the width of a slit is 0 0.01 meter, how many such slits can you have in one meter? I got 1,000. I don't know how you get 1,000. It's 100. How did you get that? It's 1 divided by 0 0.01. So that's what I said. Look, if you see D here, wouldn't it become 1 by D on this side? And what's 1 by D? N. Okay, N is the number of lines in one meter. Number of lines in one meter. Mm. M is the order of the spectrum. Go back. Lambda is the wavelength. No questions on that, right? So easy. Uh, so if you have white light, maybe concept now. If you have white light, what about the central one? The central one. You have a grating and you have white light falling on it. What about the central one? What color? White. All colors satisfy that condition right there. Okay, what about the next one? I mean the smallest angle. Will it be violet or red? Yeah, thank you. Will the separation in the second order be the same as the separation in the first? Oh. Hmm, you know it. Okay, 12. And 13. Just did it yesterday. 12 and 13. Time dilation, length contraction, and relativistic addition of... Oh, I made a mistake there. Did, did you notice a mistake? You still didn't notice it? It's plus. it's plus. Yeah, it's plus. Okay. I just wanted it to stay there. You know I could have corrected it. But I think. Maybe I corrected it afterwards. But. Okay, what's K in this equation? Oh, 9 times 10 to the 9 again? No. no. <laughs> Kinetic energy. Gamma. What's the formula for gamma? I think I didn't write it. What's the formula of gamma? 1 divided by root 1 minus V squared by 6. At least some students forget 1 divided by. Not many, but I've seen some. They like to keep it simple and get a 0. So they'll go, gamma is. They don't like the 1 by. They'll go, root 1 minus. Please don't. For every problem in relativity, first calculate gamma. And what do you know about gamma? Gamma has always got to be greater than or equal to 1. And what do we know about the speed of light? You can never perceive anything to be moving faster than the speed of light. So in any quiz question, or whatever question, you can never get an answer more than more than C. You better remember that. All right, what's P? Momentum. Gamma M times B. Yeah. 14. We come to the last one. Telescopes. You want me to ask you to draw the diagram again, right? No. It might just be there. <laughs> you never know. See, if I can use a chance to make you learn something, by now you know I will do it. So if I tell you if there is a chance, everybody is going to sit and draw it. Okay, there is a chance. So magnification is minus FO by FE. And what do you know? Why am I, see, why am I making people draw that diagram? You might think, oh, this is, he's just crazy. No. Objective. Where does it produce its image? Somebody said it. The image produced by the objective must be inside the focal point of the eyepiece. That's the important thing. Why? Because is the final image real or virtual? Virtual. And that happens only when the first image is inside the focal point of the eyepiece. That's why I was asking people to draw it, because when you draw it and you don't get it, you understand you're not getting it because the first image is not inside the focal point of the eyepiece. Do you see what I'm getting to? You realize that only then. I don't know. Okay. These sine theta, 
is 1.22 lambda. What is that? Okay, resolving power. You know what resolving power is? It's the reciprocal of the limit of resolution. Huh, what do you mean by limit of resolution? Didn't I tell you about the eye? I told you the limit of resolution of our eye is one minute. That's the fourth time I'm telling that. So if you are asked to find the resolving power of the eye, you would say one divided by one minute. Is that clear? I will tell that for the last time. Resolving power is the reciprocal of the limit of resolution. What is the limit of resolution? It's an angle. I mean, for the eye, it will be one minute, right? So for every instrument, keep that in mind. So, and like you said correctly, 1.22 comes in because it's circular instead of being rectangular. And therefore, when you make sine theta the subject, What's wrong with me? Okay, it, there should be a 1.22 there, isn't it? Surely? Where did that go missing? Okay, so 1.22 lambda by d is sine theta, from which you can calculate theta. And what's theta? Limit of resolution. So if I ask you to calculate the resolving power, what would you do? Will you just calculate theta and put that as the answer? Hello? Come on. No, you would take the... But then theta has to be in radians before you take the reciprocal. You can't have it in degrees. Well, in the case of the eye, then you will have one divided by one if you have it in minutes, and that's senseless. Okay, I told you everything required. All right, so that was 14. Did I tell you, didn't I tell you that there are 14 problems on the final exam, and I outlined the 14 topics that you need to concentrate on? So if I was in your place, I would go take these topics and try to do every problem that we have gone through. I mean, you don't have time to do new problems. Go to the problem sets, go to the quizzes, look at those problems. Don't worry about the assignments because that's going to be too difficult for you. Do you agree with me to go back there? So I did not even look at the assignments. So keep that away. Because in any case, everybody got almost 100, right? <laughs> OK, thank you. <laughs> you. You know what I'm trying. OK. And so don't look at that. Everybody got 100. So even if I'd asked you any question from there, everybody would have done all those. Yeah, kind of. OK. <laughs> so I'm not going there. Look at the problem set and the quizzes for those topics. Believe me when I say I've not gone for the toughest questions. I've gone for intermediate ones. So it's not, no, I won't say it. It's not too, so tough. I still did say it. Now, some more, some more concepts before we finish, and we're getting there so fast. You need to know the difference between charging by induction and charging by conduction. In induction, the charges are opposite. If you bring a positively charged object near a neutral object, the anterior side, if you know what anterior side is, that's going to get an opposite charge, right? So if you bring a positive, the front side will become negative, the back side will become positive. So that's induction. But charging by conduction, you're actually touching an object, isn't it? They will share the same type of charge. So if you have a positively charged object and you touch a neutral object, what will be the charge on that? It will also be positive. That's the big difference between charging by induction and charging by conduction. That's why I put versus charging by conduction. That's the difference. OK, I'm just trying to remind myself. Oh, potential difference is a big problem for some people. If I tell you, just give me one word for potential difference, not two, what will you say? You gave me the unit, that one, wo uh, one word. Some of you said word. Uh, but I want that word to show me what potential difference is, not its unit. So what will you tell me? Drop. Mm. Because the potential could either go up or go down, right? Depending on the direction of current, if you're going against the current, the potential goes up. It's not always the potential. So what's that word? So which means you really do not know how to define potential. Unless you can tell me that word. What is potential? 
Okay, how did we define the potential at a certain point? Nobody out of the 50 or so students... Don't give me, don't throw formulas at me. <laughs> don't throw formulas at me. How did we define what a potential? So, somebody said it. Thank you, Evie. It's the work done in bringing a plus one coulomb from infinity up to that point. Potential is always work. Why did I have to tell you all that? Because it's when you forget that, that all these things become tough. Watch. You have two paddle plates. One is positive, the other is negative, right? What's the direction of the field? We'll go step by step. So you have positively charged, negative charge, two plates kept. What's the direction of the field? Positive, negative. Positive, negative. Why do you say that? Okay, most people know. Uh, it's from positive, negative. Why? No, I don't know. He said so. Because that's the direction that a positive charge would move in. Because our standard is always a positive charge. Why am I saying that? Because then you will answer the next question. Which one of these two plates is at a higher potential? The positive plate or the negative plate? Which one of these two plates is at a higher potential? Positive plate, always. Why? Because the positive charge will try to go from the higher. Anything flows from high to low. What about heat? Doesn't it flow from high temperature to low temperature? Come on. What about air? Doesn't it flow from high pressure to low pressure? That's how you remember. Oh, a positive charge is our standard. How, is, how would it go? It goes from positive to negative. You can remember that, correct? So now you know, OK. Higher potential, positive plate. Lower potential, negative. But the whole thing changes. If I ask you a question about a negative charge, that's why climbing is not easy. With respect to a negative charge, which plate is at a higher potential? Negative. negative. I told you. But does that change the direction of the field? No. Field is always from positive to negative. But which point is at a higher potential depends on what charge you are talking about. Last question. Yeah, I didn't even label it A and B. If the positive plate is A and the negative plate is B, and I'm talking about an electron, where does it have a lower potential energy? I said lower potential energy, right? If you said A, you're correct. If you didn't say anything, then you don't know. Okay. So field is from positive to negative. For a positive charge, that's high potential, that's low. If it's a negative charge, I thought I wrote about that. No, I did not. Okay. But I told you, if it's a negative charge, it's opposite, right? Hello? What is Gauss's law? Can anybody state Gauss law? Uh, don't throw a formula at me. I know you have that on your paper already. It will look like phi is equal to 1 by epsilon naught times q. But do you know what they stand for? Phi is how high you can jump. No. What is phi? Electric flux. Do you know the meaning of electric flux? It's the lines, electric lines that go through, that pass through the material. Okay, what is Q? What is Q? I'm waiting, I'm listening. What is Q in that equation? So you will stop with charge. That's your problem. The charge that's all over Sang Jack. You just said charge. The charge that's in my pocket. When you say something in physics, be specific. So you're talking about a charge, right? What charge? The charge enclosed by the imaginary surface. That's how you'll study. If you study that way, you'll really study. If you simply say, one by epsilon Q, I know what Q is, Q is the charge. Oh, you didn't study anything. I'm gonna get to you. I'm gonna get to you because you don't know what charge. You don't know what charge, I'm gonna get to you. But if you know it is actually the charge inside an enclosed surface, yes. Ah.
Okay, this is the formula that I was talking about. And what's epsilon naught again? Epsilon naught? 8.85 times 10 to the negative 12. Elizabeth? What, what did you say? No, don't write it. No words. No words. That's not an abbreviation. No abbreviation and no <laughs> words. You just have to write Q. On the other one, I know I have included some words, but that's the gift that you get for taking mine. Now, what you don't get is you cannot put any abbreviation or any word. Units? No units, of course, no units. I give you all on a data sheet. Don't I? All the units, why do you need? If nothing is mentioned with an EMF in a problem, nothing is mentioned, let's say there's a sentence that says, 120 volt, 50 hertz. What is that EMF? Is that RMS or is it peak? Peak. Oh my goodness. If nothing is mentioned, it is always RMS. If it is peak, it will say it's peak. But it might not say peak, it might say maximum, which is the same. Oh, it's a good thing I said that. See, how many people would have? And I've said all these while I was teaching. You want the proof? Check the YouTube. That's why it's, it's so good, you know, convincing. So I didn't teach you? Okay, watch the YouTube this minute on this video. I did talk about it. Okay. All right, now as we almost finish, Open, closed pipes. Ah. Which of these pipes is uh, better as a musical instrument? And why? Because it produces both odd and even harmonics, isn't it? All right, here are the formulas, the fundamental frequency, I mean, for the nth harmonic, not the fundamental. Uh, you cannot go by order. <sighs> You cannot go by order there. Can you tell me, is this for an open pipe or a closed pipe? Like I said, it need not be in that order. But do you know? It's for an open pipe, correct. And this is coming up by four times the length is for a closed pipe. But do you know the values of n here can only be? No, here can only be? Huh? One, three, odd numbers, correct. One, three, five, seven, and so on for a closed pipe. But for an open, any integer. One, two, three, four. That's the big difference. Very big difference. And there is a constant question based on this. I'm telling you, there is one based on this. Huh. Electromagnetic waves. There was one question on exam four. Man, I, I don't have a heart anymore. It's, it's bled to death. Okay. Here. Whenever you try to find the direction in an electromagnetic wave, this is what you use, and this is my right hand. Right hand. In that particular question, if I remember, the wave was going to the west. It was going to the west. Let that be the west. And the magnetic field was up. Hello? The wave was going to the west. Magnetic field is up. This is surely along the south. That's the direction of the electric field. Why is this stuff? Let me try again. <laughs> <laughs> what is this? If it's going to the west, and the magnetic field is up, the electric field is to the south. If it's going to the east, it's going to the east, the magnetic field is still up. Oh, for you. <laughs> but you got what I mean. No. Right? Did you get, always use the right hand. So wait, what is position my hand now? Position all at right angles to each other. Not like that. <laughs> what do you mean by position? Can you shift these fingers? I can. I mean, I can remove this and put it here. All you have to remember is keep them at right angles to each other. That's all. But wait, if it's but if you go north, it could be going north yeah. too. Yeah, north is like 90 degrees. Like if I hold my then the magnetic field will, will be down. Well, no. Oh yeah, <laughs> we'll talk about that later. The dance continues unless you have magic fingers. Well, it's soft, but it's like... Oh, it's this way. No, it doesn't matter. All this. <laughs>
those are concept questions for sure. Oh, polarization. Oh, that would be a dead deal for some people. When you come back to polarization, remember that if it's unpolarized light and it passes through the first polarizer, what happens to the intensity? It decreases to 50% or by 50%, correct? If it is unpolarized light, remember that. That will do you so good. And then, from the first to the second, you use Malice Law, which is I is equal to I naught cos squared theta. Where, what's theta? Angle between the axis of the, the two crystals, or the two polarizers. Yes, Abdul? If it started out with 10, after the first one, it'll become 5. So you put 5 in the equation. Yeah, you put 5 in this equation to get the final one, correct. Right. And if the third one, you put that. Oh, my goodness. Then you put what you get for I here as the I naught in the next. And then you, what you get, should I continue? <laughs> I'll just play. Yeah, that's the disadvantage of taking two semesters in a row with me. I just get so much used to you that I make fun of you. Okay, field due to a straight conductor, a solenoid. Concept questions. Field due to a straight conductor, solenoid, toroid. Postulates of the special theory of relativity. And all the concepts in relativity. We have 14 points from this chapter alone. Two problems and two concept questions. So that's one chapter that you would not skip. What? <laughs> what chapter? Like what number? Thirty-six. Thirty-six is something that you will. All right, uh, you'll take a quiz today if you've not taken it already, and the answers will be posted by the time you get home. That will be the last quiz YouTube that I post with answers and. And this, of course, is going to be posted to